Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we will look at necrosis and I'm going to begin this topic by asking you a question. Look at this myocardium with an infarct. Look at this brain with an abscess. Look at these lymph nodes with the yellowish areas in the cut section. Look at this blood vessel with the pinkish material around it. Look at this pancreas which has been affected by acute pancreatitis. I'll rewind to these pictures again for us to recapitulate and then my question to you. Let us go back to the first one. First is a myocardium with an infarction a myocardial infarction. Second is a brain with an abscess. The third is a group of lymph nodes with tuberculosis. The fourth is the blood vessel and artery of a person having hypertension and the fifth is pancreas affected by acute pancreatitis and the sixth is showing you the toes of a person with a diabetic foot. What do all of them have in common? On the face of it it appears they are all distinctly different diseases. It may seemingly seem separate, but the reality is the basic pathologic process in each one of these conditions, be it myocardial infarction, brain abscess, tuberculous lymph adenitis, malignant hypertension, acute pancreatitis and diabetic foot gangrenous, all these represent manifestations of the basic pathologic process called necrosis. The first type of necrosis we encounter and which is of tremendous clinical significance is what we see in myocardial infarction and this type of necrosis is referred to as coagulative necrosis. So called because of the coagulation of proteins and it happens not only in myocardial infarction, it can happen in a splenic infarct as well. The most significant aspect, the significant morphological aspect, the gross aspect about coagulative necrosis is that 
the infarcted area appears pale. The pallor, the apparent loss of blood supply is seen on the projection slide. If you look at this myocardium under the microscope, what is described as the ghost-like appearance? The nuclei have vanished. Only what you see is the ghost remnants of the myocardium. The syncytial nature of the muscle is seen, but you can't recognize the nuclei. This is not a staining defect. It is not that the stain didn't take on. It is simply that the nuclei have vanished and this is what is characteristic of coagulative necrosis. The ghost outlines remain, the nuclear characteristics disappear. The same process of coagulative necrosis is now seen in a renal infarct. And if you look at this slide, you will see the renal tissue which is again having the ghost outlines. You can vaguely recognize the glomerulus and the tubules and yet you cannot see the nuclear details. The details that are going to give that contrast that is not seen. This is again characteristic of coagulative necrosis. For you to see the contrast between what happens in coagulative necrosis and for you to see the contrast with the normal glomerulus, you can see how the normal glomerulus is seen in comparison with a glomerulus affected by coagulative necrosis. Be aware that coagulative necrosis is also manifested in infarctions in other solid organs. For example, you here see the spleen with multiple infarcts. They are nothing but multiple foci of coagulative necrosis. A close-up of the same for you to appreciate the pallor, the loss of blood supply and therefore you see how distinctly different the necrotic area is in contrast to the normal adjacent healthy areas. The second condition which we looked at was brain with an abscess. In the brain, when necrosis happens, it's always liquefactive, meaning the tissue dissolves and that is referred to as Colliculative, the second type of necrosis is colliculative necrosis, simply means liquefactive. Colliculative, that word is a tongue twister, but the reality is that it is just representing dissolving of tissue. Whenever tissue gets dissolved, which is what happens when there is necrosis in the brain, you get colliculative or liquefactive necrosis. A more familiar and common example is the abscess. When you get collection of pus, when you have an abscess, that abscess is an example of colliculative or liquefactive necrosis. The third clinical condition which we saw was a group of lymph nodes which on cut section show a yellowish hue resembling cheese. This is called caseous necrosis. The word caseous referring to cheese, cheesy necrosis. As always happens, pathologists being food fond pathologists, they always compare everything to food and the most frequent and the most rememberable items are linked to food items. And these lesions, like caseous necrosis, they represent 
one of the classics in pathology where we see this in tuberculosis. So in tuberculosis, the necrosis that happens is usually caseating. So caseous necrosis or caseating case necrosis refers to necrosis which has a resemblance to cheese. This type of necrosis, as you can see here, is typically seen whenever tuberculosis causes destruction. And as you can see in this lung, in the hilar region, the lymph nodes are enlarged and on cut section, though it is not as yellowish as you saw in the previous slide, in this particular instance, you do find that resemblance to at least white cheese, if you may say so. What does this caseation do? Basically, that too is a type of necrosis. This is a necrosis which causes much more destruction, obvious destruction, compared to the coagulative necrosis. Here, the tissue is totally destroyed, totally wiped out, and what you see is a structureless pink material, which is actually what is caseation. So this represents a diagnostic feature in tuberculosis. We have another picture of the same process of destruction, which is obvious to you with the tissue destruction caused by tuberculosis, which has destroyed the tissue. You only see it as a homogeneous pink material. This is caseation necrosis, the third type of necrosis that we have seen. This is cerebellum as is apparent to you, but this cerebellum is affected by tuberculosis and you can see the tissue destruction. You will appreciate that the area that I have pointed to indicates the area which has been destroyed by tuberculosis. So no matter what the organ is, wherever tuberculosis happens and it causes tissue destruction, that destruction causes necrosis and that necrosis is caseous necrosis. Here you see a blood vessel, which I said was from a patient with malignant hypertension. If you look at this blood vessel, it is surrounded by bright pink material. This is what we call as fibrinoid necrosis. Fibrinoid necrosis is the next type of Oid means similar to, similar to fibrin. The bright pink material is resembling fibrin, the bright pink fibrin. That's why it's called fibrin oid. In pathology, that is what they do. They, were, they use the word oid, epithelioid, fibrin oid. So oid, when it is added, it indicates resemblance to something. And here, this type of necrosis, because it has the bright pink color resembling fibrin, it is called fibrinoid. And this is typically seen in arteries, in fact, arterioles more specifically, affected by malignant hypertension. Here is another picture to show you two vessels affected by fibrinoid necrosis and these two blood vessels are thickened because of the pink material that has accumulated and in the center you see a little bit of the lumen there is considerable narrowing of the lumen. You now see the pancreas in acute pancreatitis. This is a very characteristic almost pathognomonic finding when you encounter a patient with acute pancreatitis. Here what we have is fat necrosis. What is fat necrosis? This is the fifth type of necrosis where fat is acted on 
by the pancreatic enzymes. So the release of enzymes from the pancreas destroys the fat, acts on the fatty acid, and in the process you get saponification. So what you see here is specks, multiple spots representing saponification, soap formation. These are multiple flakes of soap. This is because of soap formation which has happened in the omentum. It's almost pathognomonic of acute pancreatitis and fat necrosis and one can make a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis if you encounter this when you are able to visualize and recognize these uh, areas of fat necrosis which is seen as saponification. The foot that you see here is from a patient who had diabetes. A person who probably had diabetes for a very long time. You see that the color of the toes have changed and they have become darker and almost blackish. This is a type of necrosis referred to as gangrenous necrosis. simply referred to as gangrene. What is gangrene? Essentially, gangrene is coagulated necrosis, the first one, plus super added infection. So when a tissue that has undergone or is undergoing coagulative necrosis gets infected with organisms, then you have a condition called gangrene. Generally, the Clostridia group of organisms are the ones which flourish or they relish being in these dead tissues. And these Clostridia group of organisms convert a coagulative necrotic tissue into a gangrenous tissue. Now, when you look at the photograph, you will see the color change. Why the color change? The color changes because of the deposition of iron sulfide. Now, why iron sulfide? What is iron sulfide doing here? When there is necrosis, when all these organisms are acting and destroying the tissue, hemoglobin gets broken down and this breakdown of hemoglobin causes the color change. So the darkish or blackish color characteristic of gangrene, almost pathognomonic again of gangrene is because of iron sulfide which is again because of the breakdown of hemoglobin. Here is yet another foot, blackish, gangrenous, but not caused by diabetes. This is caused by frostbite. So, may not be seen in tropical countries, but where extremes of cold are there and it is not possible or enough precautions have not been taken, you encounter this type of necrosis which is also gangrenous necrosis but caused by frostbite. Another common situation where gangrene happens is in the intestine. Why do you think an appendicitis must be quickly acted on and an appendix must be removed? as quickly as possible because it can become gangrenous, it can become infected. And this infected gang gangrenous appendix can cause more problems if it persists in the system. 
therefore it is quickly removed. Now in the intestine, this is of course not the appendix, this is a loop of the intestine which has twisted and you note the color change, the darkish, the blackish color which tells you distinctly I am gangrenous which is what you are seeing here and in this you recognize the color change and this too has to be acted on quickly. So what you have to remember is intestine is a very favorite location for gangrene to happen no matter where it happens. Gangrene is always characterized by this color change. So remember gangrene is after all a variation of coagulative. There are three types of gangrene one must be aware of. The dry gangrene which is typically seen in the diabetic foot, the wet gangrene which is seen in the intestine and then there is what is known as the gas gangrene which is caused by the Clostridia group of organisms which is perhaps the most serious of the three types of gangrene. Having said that, I am going to conclude with a tip to you to remember the causes of gangrene. A gangrene is a very unique condition which one must be aware of and remember the best way to remember all the causes of gangrene would be to remember the word tips, trauma, infection, physical and chemical causes and special causes. Now these special causes are further divided into the words which I am going to write here and the tip is for you to remember the word rested. What are the special causes? One is renounce phenomenon embolism, syphilis, TAO, thromboangitis obliterans, ergot poisoning and D for diabetes. If you remember tips resting on the table, you can remember the tips resting on the table. You will get tips rested and you will also get the tips to remember the causes of gangrene. We have looked at different types of necrosis. I have not gone into those things which you can easily find in the books. I haven't made an attempt to define necrosis. I have not made an attempt to talk about things which you may easily find in the book. I have tried to expose you to those things which will make you think about the clinical application, the clinical importance of necrosis. I hope at the end of the learning you will be able to at least have a snapshot of the different types of necrosis. Remember the three C's, the two F's and the G and also remember the tips rested that goes into the making of gangrene. In summary, gangrene represents death of cells or death of tissue within the living body. Having said that, there is loss of plasma membrane integrity and necrosis elicits an inflammatory response. It doesn't matter what is the type of necrosis. The basic cytological changes in necrosis are described as pycnosis condensation of the nucleus 
to an ink dot nucleus is pycnosis. Pycnosis means ink dot nucleus. The second nuclear change, no matter what type of gangrene is happening, is carrier hexis. Means hexis means fragmentation, nuclear fragmentation. And the third is karyolysis. That is, the nucleus disappears, gets lysed. It is because of this that in coagulative, or for that matter in any type of necrosis, you do not see the nucleus, because the nucleus has totally vanished. Initially, of course, there would have been pictosis and carrier hexis, but by the time you actually get to see the tissue, the dead tissue, the necrotic tissue, you would find that karyolysis has happened. And you may see the outline, or you may not see the outline, but you will see only pink material that would be representing necrosis. You will have several more areas to look at as far as necrosis is concerned. But most important is the fact that no matter what the condition is, the basic pathologic process that underlines all the clinical conditions I spoke about, the basic pathologic process is necrosis.